Welcome to Inside Shopify UX. As always, I'm your host, Lola Yolayo Pearson, Director of UX at Shopify. In this episode, I speak with senior staff product researchers, Heather McGaw and Chris Nicholson, about our research practice at Shopify and how it's changed in the last year. We discuss the power of asking why and how critical inquiry can be a form of optimism. I enjoyed this conversation, especially as Heather is moving on to her next adventure soon. We'll miss her and look forward to seeing what she does next. Let's get into it. I am delighted to have my two guests here for this episode today to talk about one of my favorite subjects and how I got my start in user experience and design research. Um, So I would love for you guys to introduce yourself to our audience and tell us a little bit about you, what you do at Shopify. So starting with you, Heather. Sure. Yeah, I'm Heather. Um, I've been at Shopify just under three years, and I'm a senior staff product researcher in an area of the organization called growth. So we really focus on how can we bring new people who aren't in on Shopify today into Shopify, thinking about like where are areas that we're not serving, who are people that we're underserving, um, that kind of thing. Amazing. We will come back to talking a little bit more about that. Um, Chris, tell us about you. Hello. Uh, Yeah, I'm Chris Nicholson. Uh, I'm also a senior staff product researcher. Uh, My area is commerce intelligence. Um, So think data, everything data, um, presenting data to merchants, um, ingesting data, transforming data, 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 data. Data, 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 and data. Uh, I don't know if if for anybody else that also just immediately puts a picture of data from Star Trek, but like that's the level of degree (laughs) that comes into my head when I just hear data, data, data. Um, Okay, (laughs) before we get into the specifics of your roles and domains, I want to maybe kick off this conversation by broadening out to the landscape of research as it is in 2022. So we'll start with a hot button topic that's been very active inside Shopify, but I also know outside Shopify. And that's the question of the commodification of research, right? So when you hear that phrase, Chris, what's your, what's your sentiment around that? Like, are, have we commodified research? Is that a problem? Um, or is there a, a reframe that maybe you have for like the current state of the, of the craft of research and research in, in general? Yeah, I I mean, I think we're trying to commoditize. I think you need to commoditize to some degree with scale, but research isn't one thing. It's like to use the crappy overused metaphor, it's a tool bag of different methods and like reasons for doing research. Anyone can pick up a hammer and learn how to use it, Mm -hmm. but you can also pick up a hammer and just start smashing shit, right? Like, yes, it's a low bar to entry, but it's also... Yeah. With, with uh, yeah, but not everyone's going to know how to use a lathe, right? Sometimes you need a lathe. Let's get folks who know how to use lathe. So I, I think it's good and bad. And I think when yeah. you think of like the gut feeling, it's always polarizing. It's either like, oh, everyone can do research, or like maybe we should be a bit more measured with this. Yes. Now I hear you. that's actually a really good distinction about give everyone a hammer and you're going to get different outputs. Right. So, um, Heather, what's your frame or what's your reaction on that phrasing of commodifying, commoditizing research? Yeah, I think like for me, so I started out, um, as a generalist, like I studied industrial design. I went into UX, um, in like the mid two thousands. And, and so UX research was like part of UX, Mm -hmm. um, as a role. And I remember like, we, like, um, this is so reminiscent to me of like design thinking, like everyone's a designer, um, you know, everyone should know how to code. Like, I think there's probably like this base level of skills, Mm -hmm. um, that, you know, if we all have, or if we have like a base understanding of like make us better collaborate collaborators and make us more effective, like in our role. And even to think about like, if I'm working with, a designer, for example, and I understand, you know, some basic things around um, interaction design, that's going to help me if, if I'm doing research with a designer, like help think about like, you know, what are the questions for this or like how, you know, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. So to me, it's like research sort of hitting that like 
milestone, I guess, um, yes. around product development. Yeah. That's how we sort of think about it. And I, I think there's a line to walk because obviously, yeah. you know, it is, um, it is a skill, there's skill set to it. There's craft to it. Um, there's, there's, um, also like risk to doing it poorly mm -hmm. and things like that. So it's also about like, how do you put on the right guardrails? How do you develop sort of like frameworks to think about like what type of research happens by who or like, how do we kind of make sure we're doing this sort of democratization of research in a way that's actually effective and not producing like poor data or harming the people that we're doing research with. Yeah. I, that's such a good point. I think this is where that, that I think your analogy, Chris comes into play as well. It's like, there is a spectrum of skill needed depending on the context. And when you start to think about issues of harm and inclusion, you probably want somebody who's like an expert on how to do the right type of inquiry and the right type of, you know, building safety and confidence around and ethics into yeah. research. But if you just want to test if anyone's going to click this button, that's probably okay if you went and got like a basic tool, didn't really have that much skill, but could put it in front of a few people. And that feedback is probably useful and valid. And so you can commoditize research at the same time as recognizing points where there is a need for like highly skilled experienced craft and guardrails. And yeah, I think a way that we think about it at Shopify is like, what are the decisions that yes. this research is informing? Yeah. Um, and that can give us a good sense of like, you know, who, who should be doing this research and how should research be involved? How should researchers be involved in it? Yeah. And you raised a, a nice example, Lola, which I think Heather, you were getting at of the like common language or like the baseline understanding that everyone can have and how that increases yeah. the ability to communicate. But something as simple as, you know, usability testing or like clicking this button, I see this all the time at Shopify. Mm -hmm. Merchants, how do merchants do X? Well, what do you mean by merchants? Like, like that in itself, oh, I did a usability test with, you know, we ran a usability test with 20 folks. Well, was that the group that you were intending? Like, is that the user group yeah. that you're curious about? Or is this just random yeah. sampling and, and yeah. not understanding how important that is? Yeah. is like a very simple distinction, but you can basically just, you can invalidate a whole body of work. It's so, okay. So that's a really fascinating one because I definitely know that late last year, and I, I keep doing this on this podcast. I don't love Twitter, but I bring the Twitter fights into the podcast because it's just such <laughs> oh, no. an easy, it's an easy place to go for all the kind of conflict, but this is why I a, avoid, this is why I don't have Twitter. Oh uh, yeah. Smart person, <laughs> smart person. Um, but there was an interesting conversation that I did not participate in, but I what I observed it happen, which was like, seemingly tech savvy individual working on product X says research is useless <laughs> and there's no point asking people about anything brings in the misattributed Henry Ford quote and then is subsequently like followed by a million and one people piling on and saying yeah and yeah we don't need and blah but I think the point you just made Chris is perfect which is there is your users and then there are the people who are actually using the thing that you want to find out. And there can yeah. sometimes be a massive chasm between your perception and the reality. And then you're totally failing fundamentally if you're not connecting the dots uh, or yeah. if you're not intentional about how you go out seeking insight, right? Which is, you know, probably the biggest ask is like, be more intentional in the first place. And then you'll probably get the quality. If you're not, you probably think research is rubbish, right? Exactly. I think there's like a misnomer that fits into that too, which is that you go out and you ask people what they want and then you bring that oh. back in and you build it. Let's like, talk I, about that. <laughs> <laughs> Let's debunk that because that is as much as it's painful, that is genuinely what people think. And sometimes they'll say, what did the merchants or what did the users say? Because in their mind, what people said is the thing they have to listen to. So maybe to frame it more constructively, how does good research actually inform a product decision? And maybe Heather, starting with you, like how, how would you explain to someone how research informs a product decision? Yeah, so we, last year we spent a lot of time 
um, in my product area, helping helping people do some of their own research. And this was a big topic, which is like thinking about like what are <laughs> like what are the goals? Like what are the research questions? It's so basic, but it's like what are the research questions that you have? Yeah, those are not the same as the things you're going to go out and ask people. And so like mm-hmm. so thinking about the research questions, like how do you answer those research questions? And it might be through a set of other questions. It might be through an observation. It might be through measuring something, but just understanding like that those are two distinct things. Yeah. Yeah. And Chris, how do you maybe frame that for people as well? Yeah. So something that comes up a lot in my area is understanding like what the ultimate product strategy is, because at the end of the day, if, if you just want to go out and, and, do research on things that are interesting or things that we don't understand um, or things that we as researchers think are are interesting threads to pull on. Mm -hmm. Um, You can often find yourself getting way far away from where a product team is actually the space they're playing in. So uh, I think a big thing for me is, you know, what is the ultimate strategy of a product team? Where are they likely going now? This doesn't get into like, if you're helping obviously, pave that way or figuring out which way a product team should be going. Um, Mm -hmm. But where do the, where are the risks? Cause there's going to be a product strategy. Like we're a part of a big organization. There, there is an ultimate strategy here that we're working towards hopefully. Um, So what are the risky areas and, and what information do I, could I provide the team that would help them make less risky decisions? Like that's been a philosophy. I think there's like, I really like what you said. And I think there's um, like another side to that too, which is like sometimes um, there is something that a researcher is like, you know, that's kind of interesting. And Mm. like, can you time box that or, you know, give a little time to it to see like, where does that go? Because Debbie Chan, who's like another researcher at Shopify, um, we were talking about this recently and about the role of like research inspiring strategy. And so thinking ahead about like, anticipating like where we might go um, and doing some research in that space. That, I mean, we, we recently had some uh, research done in my area by Jeremy Hedges, great researcher in my team. Uh, and he framed it as the biggest difference, right? So the positioning is we have a long list of asks and things that we think we want to do. We're going to have to make some priority calls. So rather than just saying, do people want direction A or B, he dug into maybe more of their need state. And then try to pull out, well, in the situations they're in, this made more of a difference than that. And so for a product team, it's not telling you exactly what you want to do, but it is helping you find a way to decide between two paths by giving you like prompts on how people are responding to their need state. And I think that's the superpower of this kind of uh, highly skilled edge of, of research craft where like, there is, here's what's interesting about what people are doing. Here's how we might de-risk an outcome, but also here's how you might, here are some ways in which you might be able to make some priority calls because you're inevitably going to have to make some priority calls. Um, So let's ground everything back into our Shopify world. So you both introduced yourselves as senior staff product researchers and around about 15 months ago, we underwent an evolution from UX research to product research. So maybe starting with you, Chris, define the framing of product research and and what that looks like in the way you now do your job, which may or may not be that different from the job that you used to do when your title was UX research. Yeah, so I I think- No small questions here, by the way. No, no, no. (laughs) Yeah, Throw a big easy. volcano this, of a question yeah, in there. This it's isn't like, dangerous give it a go. at all. <laughs> I, I think research at Shopify has always aspired to impact strategy and the big, meaty, dangerous, yeah. directional questions. Um, that for five and a half years, that has always been what we wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but in a company that scales so fast and our UX mm. team was growing so fast there's always this tendency to slip into very like tactical things Mm -hmm. Um, because a lot of UX designers are are excellent at doing evaluative research, uh, testing their own uh, designs, getting feedback, staying close to the front line. But when you scale and there Mm -hmm. are a lot of projects and there's a researcher, 
people go, oh, well, you're, you're good at this. You could do this in your sleep, you know, yeah. do, do some evaluative work. So I think we, we started to getting into both, both strategy and this very evaluative stuff. We always wanted to be at the table. We always wanted to be informing strategy. Um, so what this change did in my mind, or at least for myself, was it gave us a clearer mandate to be mm -hmm. in those strategy discussions and be working on, on more strategy things. I think internally, it felt like research was doing the wrong things. But as a researcher, I, I didn't really feel that. Mm -hmm. um, it was, you know, we, we were doing what we needed to do to move teams forward. Yeah. Um, so at the end of the day, nothing really changed for myself. Um, yeah. I, I still have that foot in product, that foot in UX. The move from UX research to product research, mm -hmm. I think, has been about giving space to do, you know, the more strategic research. But but, um, I think a thing that happened, like, at least for me last year was like, really, like, what does strategic mean? <laughs> and yeah. how is strategy produced? Yeah. And yes. how do like how do how are teams developing strategy because that could look really different and yeah. depending on you know Shopify is an enormous ambitious space yes. we're working in so many different areas and with really different levels of maturity in those areas mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um so i think it takes like a different form in different places so for example um prior to the reorg i was working in cross border which is all about helping merchants sell um cross border and that was a relatively new space for us to be doing product development. So, mm -hmm. you know, after the reorg, I was in the same space. I found my, the research, the top priorities, like, didn't change. Like, the, the studies yeah. I was doing sort of remained the same because we're sort of in this new space where sort of forward-looking and thinking about these things we hadn't been thinking about were really, really important. Um, whereas I imagine that felt, like, really different in spaces where we were more mature. Yeah. Um, yeah, so... But yeah, it's interesting. Like I've had a lot of discussions and debates around like, what is strategy? <laughs> yeah. Know? And I, I think it, there's a tendency because when you want to boil it down to here's a job description and here's a swim lane and be like super explicit, it sometimes oversimplifies what is by nature, like quite a, an amorphous thing. Right. And so I think for me, the opportunity with that transition and what I'm seeing happen now with product research and product researchers is an inquiry as to what are we trying to understand? So like having worked at places before Shopify, I have definitely seen a lot of commodification of research and of researchers, right? Almost no autonomy to say, Hey, I want to ask you if this is even a good question. It's like, no, no, we need to tick the research box. Did we do the study? Every project starts with discovery. Like there is no critical thinking to say like in this context, given all of this stuff, we already know what's left and what do we do with what's left? And I feel like this shift has forced us into this slightly less comfortable, but probably ultimately more interesting space. And certainly for the people that we have in the role now, and like, like I love working with the both of you because you're not naturally takers of instruction. You're kind of like, what do you mean? <laughs> Type people. But that is, that is, I think, the, the, the mindset that it's designed to encourage, right? It's like, your role is not to default into, I must do research. Anyone asks a research question, let me do research, which maybe it was veering towards. It is, what are you really trying to achieve here? And I totally see that strategy is like, who knows? But the questions that you need to ask to understand what research you need to go and get ultimately end up being bigger than just a single product or like a, a button shift on a page or something. Or maybe yeah. they distill down to that, but it's, it allows for like a broader set of, of perspectives to say, like, what are we seeing? What do we need, really need? Do you know what I mean? Which yeah. is uncomfortable, but is good. Very. <laughs> I think I, I don't know what your experience has been like, Heather, but it research has become, or it's become a joke that I'm always the annoying one in the room because the team is like, Oh, we need to do X, Y, and Z. Oh, well, why, why? Like, yeah. Tell me why. Yeah. Uh, or we, we need to understand this. Do you act, do you actually understand this? Maybe you already do understand this. Uh, yeah. so there is a lot of that. Yeah. 
I agree. I've also found like in the spaces we're working in now, there's a much stronger partnership with product, Mm -hmm. which has been a really nice outcome of this. And I, and also I think more collaboration with data and market insights. Mm -hmm. So, cause we're answering, I think bigger questions um, where there's a lot less clarity. Um, So being able to sort of like look from these different lenses has been really, really helpful. Yeah. So tell us, let's talk a little bit about the specific areas that you both work in, because I think they're both really ripe, interesting spaces for the, you know, the craft of research. So staying with you for a second, Heather, what are the most interesting questions that maybe you guys are looking into in growth? Like, how are you framing the insight work you need to do that? Yeah. So one of the things we're looking at, like I mentioned, um, on growth and in the area I'm working on specifically doing research, it's about like, basically what are different audiences that we could Mm -hmm. be working with, like serving that we aren't serving today or Mm -hmm. we're underserving. So Mm -hmm. we're looking at um, like emerging markets and what are the needs there that we're just not meeting and understanding, understanding those needs and the context around those needs. Amazing. And then um, another big area for us is looking at the creator economy. Like these are really different types of merchants compared to how we usually think about small businesses. So yeah. thinking about, you know, for an individual who's creating content and trying to monetize that, what are different ways that we can support them? Yeah, I love both those questions because I I tell people a lot and I was on a podcast this morning actually talking about like when we say the mission is make commerce better for everyone, then there's actually a really big requirement, which is who's everyone, right? And how much of what everyone now needs do we design for? Like, where is the 80% and that, that Pareto principle, like where are we hitting that boundary and starting to move towards more complicated places that don't look like Northwestern America and, you know, Central Europe, but have much more varied shapes in commerce. Super interesting but I can imagine also very difficult uh, because the practicalities are also, you know, we can't just travel everywhere and do that kind of research anymore. Right. So um, the day to day practicalities I'm imagining are interesting at the moment with designing studies for those questions. Yeah, very much. Yeah. Yeah. I, um, you know, I love field research. I love international field research and not being able to do that is, um, (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it's it makes you think more creatively. Like we've thought and have done some interesting like generative research um remotely this year that we mm-hmm. wouldn't have done otherwise. Um and another thing with that space too is like it's so big, so how do you narrow it down and have yeah. like actual research questions that aren't just like what could we do here or you know, yeah. um not too so, open-ended. Yeah. 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 So that's like the big challenge in that space I find. It's awesome. And Chris, data, data, data. How does product research inform data? Don't they already have all the data? What are you doing? You would think. <laughs> uh, yeah, so broad strokes, merchants are running their business or a portion of their business on our platform. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're obviously capturing data about that business. And I think it generally accepted that if you make good data informed decisions, generally that will lead to better outcomes. Yes. That's kind of the working assumption. If that's not right, I think yeah. we have some issues. <laughs> um, so our team is concerned with getting our merchants. I say the term merchants, but the shop owners, the staff, the specialized staff, the marketing mm-hmm. managers, the mm-hmm. e-com managers, whoever's making business decisions, um, give them access to that data, um, allow them to analyze that data in a reasonable fashion, and then ultimately make a decision. Like Mm -hmm. this would be if we were doing research and not sharing it to our teams or not, there was no decisions being made based on the research. That's not helpful. And Mm -hmm. we want to make sure that our merchants are using that data to ultimately make decisions. And this is where, my job gets really difficult because on products where there is some transaction that takes place or there is some clear outcome, you know, we, Mm -hmm. we want users to do X and when they do X, a little flag goes up, they've done X. Great. Yeah. 
Um, with data products, it's really hard to measure the ultimate impact of that data. Mm -hmm. So we know that people are consuming the data. We know how they're analyzing it potentially, but the decision may be made somewhere else in the product or off the platform entirely. Yeah. So trying to connect those dots for the team to help them understand, you know, this is where we are deficient. This, these are decisions that we could be helping inform, but we're not. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a big part of it. I feel like that is some of the fun in working with data though, is that, so like you're close to that magic sweet spot of here's a bunch of quant, what happened and here are a bunch right. of questions about what next. And then somehow you've got to go and put those things together and say, well, maybe this is what's going on and this is what we might do about it. Whereas maybe in other teams, actually that access to that volume of, here's the hard quant data, here are the metrics is a little bit harder. So the, the impact question may be a bit harder to access, but certainly the richness of what you can work with is huge. Yeah. And uh, I mean, from a research perspective, even kind of ignoring the space, working with our data science team is just like, we, we would have a job yeah. indefinitely. I work very closely with, with a data scientist, uh, Rachel, um, and she you know, we look at the data and quite often you look very closely and you go, oh, great. This means X. Well, mm -hmm. does it like our folks actually, is that what they're actually doing? There's no way of knowing. So then you yeah. have to put your reach their hat on and, and actually I'll go figure it out. Give the why. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. So then let's talk about a craft area that I think has been a really exciting topic as we're looking at how do we expand and evolve the toolkit the product researchers have, which again, I think this is a general conversation in the craft, but one that's definitely been hot button, which is foresight work. So futures thinking and strategic foresight. So first of all, can you help us define that? Because Heather, you've been bringing a lot of training and knowledge into the organization about this. So what is strategic foresight and why is it a research craft that we're super interested in? It's sort of like, what are possible, how might, like, how might we anticipate, like, what are things to anticipate or um, sort mm -hmm. of, sort of future proofing in a way or thinking about like looking out into the horizon, like, like what are things happening now that might become relevant for the business? Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's not about like predicting the future. No, it's more thinking about mm, po like possible, fu multiple futures, possible futures and thinking about, yeah. you know, are there, um, is there a group now that if we understand them, we think they represent sort of some leading edge of this thing or can like really making a practice of understanding like what's going on in the world mm -hmm. and what of those things are really relevant to us as a business um, mm -hmm. and kind of thinking about like in that scenario, you know, what are different ways that we want to, would want to respond. And so it's like developing strategies around anticipating possible futures and helping the business like future proof for that or like identify yeah. opportunities that we might miss otherwise if we're just focused on what's happening like right now and like what's kind of like not challenging or thinking at all. It's, I think so one of the ways I absorb it is like traditionally when you're doing generative research, you kind of focus solely on the now state, right? Like you look at all of the things and implications and behaviors as they exist right now. And then you bring that back as what is happening today, but you don't necessarily hypothesize a, a trajectory for that behavior. Whereas with foresight and strategic foresight or, or speculative techniques, you're actually saying what from what we see now is likely to be a behavioral shift. And so how do we move from what we've seen today into a point in the future where those behaviors intersect with something that we can do? So we are punting uh, into the future based on what we can see today, but there are specific techniques that give us confidence. So we're not just like doing crystal ball gaze type stuff, right? Like we're actually using some technical guardrails to help us make those punts. Does that, does that sound about right? <laughs> 
Yeah. And I think broadening it too, like it's, it's about, um, you know, not just, um, what are, what are people doing? Like what are, what's, um, what's going on in e-commerce or something like that, or commerce, yeah. commerce more generally, it's looking at like what's going on culturally, what's going yeah. on with science, what's going on with government, like looking at all yeah. of those different sort of indicators yeah. and then pulling that back into a space to develop, um, like scenarios or yeah. Uh, the other thing is like, um, the speculative piece, like using it mm-hmm. as, as a tool to speculate as a team yeah. or as an organization about possible futures that are desirable, that are undesirable. Like what's the direction yeah. that we want to go and what's our yeah. role in that as well. Yeah. I feel like an exercise that I put, I did with my team a few months back was we looked at utopias and dystopias, right? So we took, we took a product as it was today, and then we created a context for that product in five years. And then we had utopia outcomes where like everything goes well, and then dystopia outcomes where everything falls apart. And we tried to understand what the evolution was. And not only was that fun, but again, it's like, you know, using some of these guardrails, like we only know what we know now and we are making a bunch of assumptions, but we do know what the product is, right? So how do we ground the product in what we know now and then use some of those assumptions in a, in a constrained, but interesting way. And I don't know, Chris, have you been able to bring some of that into your work yet? Or how are you thinking about those foresight techniques? Yeah, it's interesting. This is, this is a very honest comment. I feel like the foresight thing was kind of, I had never heard the term. And then it was like, everything is foresight. Like this is the future. So I feel like anyone doing foresight. Yeah. Right. Like anyone doing foresight a year ago should have seen this coming. Um, (laughs) uh, I think, I think I'm in a, an interesting position where I've had the privilege of being in this, this specific product domain for five and a half years. Yeah. Um, and I feel like I have to, like, I'm, I'm always doing foresight or yeah. I'm always trying to do foresight, right? Like I, I have to understand the domain. And when you understand the domain, you start to get an idea of like what the likely futures are. Cause obviously mm-hmm. you don't want to go, Oh, well there are infinite futures. Like, guess we can't yeah. pick some, like there are some that are more or less like it's a probabilistic thing. There's yeah. more or less probable futures. Um, so I think something that, this makes me think of when people talk about it is something that my product director says a lot is like, what are the one way or two way doors? Um, Mm. So it's like, what we're doing today, is this a one way door or two way door? Can we come back through this door if X happens in the future? So so like one of these things recently with iOS 14 rolling out uh, a bunch of marketing data being restricted attribution data. Mm -hmm. Like we found ourselves in a position where, like everything had changed for us and, and everyone saw it coming. Like we knew Apple was going to do this. This didn't come out of nowhere, but we knew that the attribution stuff was not a one way door when we were building Mm -hmm. things. So we could come back, we can pivot. So I I think that helps kind of focus the future as well. It's like, if it's a, if it's a one way door, we need to be sure that, you know, future X, Y, and Z are very unlikely. Yeah. That makes sense. No, it is. And to, to a point you're making, I think if you've been in deep crafter mode for a while, a lot of these, um, techniques aren't unfamiliar, even if the packaging is evolving. Right. And I think, I think that's the opportunity. It's like, it is emerging out of the research craft that we are codifying a thing we've always sort of done but recognizing that we need to give it a bit more reach in order to kind of, and what I quite like about um, some of the conversations around this is again, where sometimes with research historically, it's like you almost get too narrow in your research question and you get too narrow in your implication exploration, speculative and, and foresight techniques kind of force the expansion, right? You can't ignore the socioeconomic context. You can't ignore wider product environment. You can't ignore the regulatory implications and then really big infrastructure or platform player changes the rules. 
So you kind of bring all of those dynamics in and then you say, here's my segment and here's my product and here's my problem. And you have to consider that interplay. And I think that intentionality that's built in feels really good. Again, like, what does it mean? What will it tell us? We don't know, but it feels nice that we're looking at it and want to, wanting to be kind of complete in the way we inquire. Yeah, well, yes, I totally agree with that. And I, it's like looking at it in like a rigorous, like structured way. Yes. You know, and... And I think the futures research like really is about expanding the tool case, like, or the toolkit, like yeah. um, there is a lot rooted in, um, you know, social sciences um, and stra- like strategy, like big S strategy. <laughs> yeah. um, and that's like a really good thing. And I think that um, it's interesting because like, what's the role of research in mm-hmm. tech I think tech like often is very um, like prides itself on being really positive, right? Mm-hmm. Like, um, yeah. and research is can be critical, um, and so sometimes I think that can feel at odds. But yeah. I think like that critical inquiry is like has, crucial. It's crucial, but also is is a form of optimism because it's, it's about like understanding and moving forward. I love that. So I think the futures research and strategic foresight, I think plays a role in that. Like, how do we look forward and how do we find opportunity and hope and these types of things in spaces um, that we're not thinking about yet, or we're not thinking or or we're thinking in a, a certain way we haven't expanded into yet. Yeah. And I, I really like that framing because it ties into something that Shay said in um, the accessibility episode on this podcast, which is talking about accessibility being almost like usability, but inclusion being about like harm avoidance. So you kind of go that extra step. And I think I, I really like connecting that to the context where critical inquiry is a form of optimism, right? We are literally looking to see where the boundaries are so that the first attempt is a less harmful uh, attempt in all ways that it can be. Like you can never fully predict, but we certainly shouldn't be putting stuff out there and then saying, we'll go figure out if it's good or bad afterwards. You know, it's, we can definitely start from a place of hang, hang on, here's a complete, a more complete hypothetical picture of what we could be doing. And let's interrogate that before we go out all bullish and horns and the tech can do so many things. It's like, yes, but should it, you know, questions come in. Yeah. And, um, and just to innovate, right. Like if you're thinking about it critically, um, and rigorously, you're going to think about it in ways that other people aren't thinking about it. Yeah. That's what makes it fun. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) This has been such a cool, maybe like, too deep geekery in some ways, but like, I'm always here for that (laughs) into the research craft. Let's do our little, uh, episode ending. Fun thing. First thing I have to ask you is what did you call this when you were growing up? Cause we've had many names on the podcast. Does it have a name? Well, yeah. It's just the thing that you made. Paper thingy. Fortune teller. Oh, there you go. Fortune teller ads. We've had fortune teller. We've had Chatterbox. We've also had Cootie Catcher. Uh, And Cynthia, I think, gave me the best one. In French, I don't know if I'm doing this right. I'm probably butchering this. It's called Pion Pion. There you go. This is a Pion Pion. I love it. uh, (laughs) Moving into it, starting with you, Chris. Can you pick a cart, banana, rocket, or lettuce? Oh, rocket. Rocket, Rocket. okay. R O C K E T, and then you've got the numbers one, two, five, and six, which you probably can't see. Five. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, and now you have four, seven, three, and eight. Seven. Seven. Question seven. I feel like a lot of people have had question seven, but let's go in. Question seven is. Seven is is one of those numbers that people always pick. There's probably a reason. It's a good thing. Um, what's your process for starting a new thing? So you've just been brought in to have a conversation about a new piece of work. What are those go-to things that you start with? 
I immediately went to hobby. I wasn't thinking work. I was like, how do I start hobbies? <laughs> no, but that, I think both are applicable. <laughs> um, no, I, I hope not because it doesn't say much for my, my work process if I'm treating it like I do hobbies, which is just dive in like- from too far and then put everything in a box when I've given up. So does that mean that the Lego behind you was built without following the instructions? Is this what you're saying to me? Because I no, this okay. was built with instructions. That's <laughs> cath- that's soothing to me. Following <laughs> that's instructions. meditation. Okay. Um, I, questions like if it's a new if it's a new project or space, like I yeah. kind of alluded to, I'm the annoying one in the room. It's just why, why, why? Yeah. Like what do we yeah. know? I think every researcher probably does that, but yes, just trying to understand why and why are we asking. Like, why is this important? I love it. Chris the Why. That's your new nickname. Uh, Heather, <laughs> what would you like to start with? I'll pick the banana. Banana. Okay. Uh, spelling banana. Okay. B A N A N A. Okay. You have four, three, seven, and eight. Three. One, two, three. Uh, one, two, five, or six. Two. Two. Okay, I don't think many people have picked two. Um, ooh, what is your favorite iconic design? Can be digital or not? My favorite iconic design? Ooh, okay, I don't know how iconic it is, but... I mean, it's for you. <laughs> um, so there's this industrial designer named Hella Youngarius, um, mm. and she's really well known for combining materials in unexpected ways and for finding ways to make, to take like um, sort of mass production techniques and um, disrupt that process in some way so that what's being produced is unique. Oh, I love this. So she, has she, does she work in art form or like actual functional products? Functional products. So um, (sighs) like, tableware rugs um she she did some interesting stuff with like ceramics and glass um yeah she sounds important but also expensive but you should go <laughs> very <at> yeah <laughs> <laughs> chris heather thank you so so much this has been a really fun episode to record um I'm pretty sure we will put some information about how people can find you. Chris is not on Twitter, but I believe Heather <laughs> is. Decidedly uh, so. We'll share LinkedIn to, uh, if anyone has questions about product research at Shopify, couldn't go far wrong with talking to these amazing people. So thank you so, so much for being on the episode today. Thank you for listening to Inside Shopify UX. Check out more from our team or find out how to join us by visiting ux.shopify.com. Inside Shopify UX is hosted by me, Lola Yulayo Pearson. Produced by Jen Shaw. Assisted by Isabel Hamel Karassi. Edited by Michael Busser. With art and graphics by Alicia Giroux. Danny Chavez Ackerman. And Trevor Slovani. Music by Silent Quiet Spaces. On our final episode of this season, I'm talking Shop, Shopify's popular buyer experience app.